There is nothing quite like camping. You have the stars, the relaxing sounds of nature, the solitude. You have good food cooked over a campfire, and of course, the scary stories, whether true or not. But when you're camping, you're also extremely vulnerable, depending on where you're camping and what protection you carry. The more isolated you are and the more privacy you have, the more vulnerable you are because no one can hear you scream. My husband and I, along with our dachshund, have been camping a few times in Stone Mountain State Park in North Carolina, and I felt very safe. But once it was time to go to sleep, I couldn't. That's when we are the most vulnerable. I have this fear that someone will walk up to our tent and that will be yet another camping death statistic. But enough about me. Camping in the 70s and 80s was pretty dangerous, with two of the most well-known cases being the Oklahoma Girl Scout murders in 1977, which I did a video on, as well as the Caddy murders in Cabin 28 in 1981. In 1973, four teenage boys were killed while camping in the California woods. They had each been shot once in the head, and their bodies were found in their tent a week later. The killer, his name was Herbert Mullen, and he was active during the same time as another infamous serial killer, Edmund Kemper. Mullen was a fan of marijuana and LSD, but he was also a paranoid schizophrenic. The LSD only worsened his symptoms. Now, the voices in his head were telling him that ritual sacrifices would prevent a catastrophic earthquake from decimating California. He believed that the four boys had telepathically offered themselves to be his sacrifices. And by this point, he had already killed eight other people. His birthday was April the 18th, which is the anniversary date of the San Francisco earthquake that took place in 1906. And as his mental health got worse, he became more and more obsessed with earthquakes. So when a man named Reuben Greenspan predicted that on January the 4th, 1973, the San Andreas Fault would again become unstable and California could potentially fall into the sea, Mullen knew that he had to do something and he had to do it quick. When January 4th came and went without any earthquakes, Mullen believed that it was because of him. On January the 25th in 1973, he killed five more people all in the same day. Now, one day he went to St. Mary's Catholic Church to confess to one of his crimes, but his delusions made him believe that this priest was also volunteering to be his next sacrifice. So, Mullen killed the priest in the confessional booth and then he ran out of the church. He was seen by a witness, but the description that they gave the police wasn't enough to find him. For his 13th and final murder, he made the mistake of using the very same weapon that he used with the teenagers. And he was finally caught and sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole in 2025. He passed away in 2022. He is known for saying, we human beings through the history of the world have prevented our continent from cataclysms by murder. In other words, a minor natural disaster avoids a major natural disaster. On a cold night in Missouri Headwaters State Park in Montana near Three Forks, the Yeager family went to bed in their tents. They were from Michigan and were camping in Montana for an entire month, so they were planning on waking up early for Glacier National Park, which is also in Montana. There were five children in all in the group, and the oldest son slept in the van. They had a camping van, while the other four slept in a tent. Susie was cozy in her bed with her stuffed animals after getting a goodnight hug from her mother. Heidi, which is one of Susie's sisters, said that they whispered back and forth to each other about something, and then they fell back to sleep. Around 4.30 that morning, Heidi woke up because she felt a draft. The draft was coming from a hole that had been cut in the tent, and the cut was exactly where Susie's head was. Someone had gotten into their tent and pulled Susie out without anyone seeing or hearing anything. In the same area, in 1968, a 12-year-old Boy Scout named Michael Rainey was also killed. The spot of his tent was 25 feet away from Susie's. Her teddy bear and stuffed reindeer that she always had with her were found a very short distance away. 
Her father, Bill, he drove to the closest phone, which was a town away, and then he called the sheriff. The police initially thought that Susie may have just wandered off, but once they saw the cut on the tent, they changed their mind. They knew that they were dealing with something more sinister. A day after the crime, the FBI was put in charge and Special Agent Dunbar put in place the largest missing person search in Montana's history. Three days after she disappeared, a man called an FBI office in Denver, Colorado, claiming that he had kidnapped Susie and was demanding $25,000 in ransom. Police agreed to transfer the ransom, but no one came to the drop-off point. As time went on, hundreds of tips rolled in, but neither the FBI or local law enforcement had any leads or suspects. Dunbar led the Behavioral Science Unit, which is now known as the Behavioral Analysis Unit, and he determined that the suspect was a young white male with a background in the telecommunications industry or the military and that he lived near the campsite. The fact that the suspect took Susie without alarming anyone also showed that he was organized. He was slightly older and was a loner with average to above average intelligence. Also, at this time, the FBI was testing a new method of tracking killers called offender profile. A man named Ralph Green reported receiving an invoice for a phone call that was made on the 25th that he had never made. So while police were investigating his telephone cables, they found a voice gateway and other devices that were built into a line break, which they suspected Susie's kidnapper had used to make the call. Their suspect definitely had a background in telecommunications and the military. He was a Marine that served in the 5th Communications Battalion, and he was even awarded for his achievements in deploying communication systems. On July the 2nd, Deputy Ron Brown received a phone call. His wife answered the phone, and someone was demanding $50,000. And to back up their claims, they described a unique fingernail that Susie had. It was her index finger. And this was confirmed by her family, so it was the actual kidnapper. On September the 24th, he called the Jaeger family and he talked to Susie's older brother, Daniel. And during this call, he referred to his previous calls to the sheriff and the FBI to prove that it was him. Eight months after Susie was abducted, 19-year-old Sandra Smolligan disappeared. Her car was found covered in a barn on an abandoned property and about 1,200 pieces of charred and scarred bone were also found in a burn pit. The fragments belonged to two separate victims. The first was a girl aged 6 to 8, while the other was a woman aged 18 to 20. By this time, the police had wiretapped the Jaeger home in case the killer called, because they often do, especially on the anniversary. So on the one year anniversary of Susie's disappearance, her mother Marietta said the phone rang at 2 a.m., the exact moment that Susie was taken. She said instinctively she knew who it was and that it was clear that he was calling to taunt her. She said that he was being smug and nasty and he told Marietta that Susie was alive and that she was in Europe. Marietta was very compassionate. This caused the kidnapper David Meyerhofer to break down and he sobbed and sobbed and he finally let his guard down. The call lasted about 80 minutes and he had unintentionally but thankfully given enough information to be identified. Just days before he was arrested, Marietta got to meet with him and she looked him dead in his eyes. She shook his hand and then she told him that she knew what he had done to her daughter but that she forgave him. Agent Dunbar was eventually able to obtain a search warrant for David's apartment, and there he found the remains of Sandra Smolligan. He was arrested, and he confessed to four murders, three of which were children. A few hours after the interrogation was over, he used a jail-issued towel to hang himself in his cell. Because of the interrogation, Marietta learned that Susie had been killed within a week after she was abducted. Once he took Susie out of the tent, they went to his pickup and he took her to a ranch that belonged to a man named Bill Bryant. He took Susie to an abandoned property in the middle of Lockhart Ranch and then he took her clothes off. She started to squirm because he started to touch her and she didn't like that. So this upset him, so he choked her to death. He then dismembered her. 
he put her head in an outhouse behind the property and the rest of her remains were set fire. The main part of her torso, he said, during his confession, was burned alongside a culvert on the road between the Lockhart Ranch and Menard. He dismembered the bodies with a hunting knife and then burned them in a fire pit before finally scattering their ashes and remaining bones at the Lockhart place. According to the Daily Beast, he had also wrapped up some of the parts, labeled them deer meat, and stored them in his freezer. On an August night in 1986, 16-year-old Jacob Weidman, who went by Jake, brutally stabbed his summer camp roommate, Eric Kane. Eric died in a Flagstaff motel room while they were on a tour of Western states. It was a trip that was sponsored by a private Maine summer camp. They were from the East Coast and they were visiting places on the West Coast. He and Jacob were traveling with two other boys and a counselor, and they were visiting national parks and other famous locations. Their next stop was going to be the Grand Canyon. When the group stopped on October the 12th, Eric and Jacob were assigned as roommates. Now, early the next morning, Eric was found dead in the bathroom by the camp counselor. The night before, Jake had asked the camp counselor for the keys to the rental car that they were traveling in. In the next morning, Jake, $3,000 in traveler's checks that he stole and the car were gone. A month later, Jake called Flagstaff police from a Boston psychiatric center and he confessed, but he couldn't explain why he did what he did. During his confession, he said that the crime wasn't premeditated and that it was the result of a buildup of emotions. He said that he just woke up and that he didn't know what he was doing. He just wasn't thinking straight. He also said that Eric hadn't done anything to provoke him. But I have one question. If it wasn't premeditated, why did he ask for the keys the night before? Was he just planning on running away himself by himself? He woke up around 1.30 to go for a walk because he said that he was restless. He put on his clothes and then he saw the knife that was beside his bed. Then he saw Eric here sleeping. He had purchased the knife earlier in a Yellowstone National Park store. So he then picks up the knife and then he stabbed Eric in the chest in another place that he just couldn't remember. He was sentenced as an adult and he received a life sentence with the possibility of parole after 25 years. He served his time and was let out on parole 30 years later, but his parole was quickly revoked because he missed a psychologist appointment. And that is a whole nother story on its own, if you're interested in looking that up. In 1988, Keith Reinhardt was 49 and he was a sports writer for the Daily Herald in Chicago. He was fascinated by the story of a man named Tom Young. This man was from Silver Plume, Colorado, and he had disappeared under mysterious circumstances in 1987. Tom Young had owned a bookstore and he closed up the store and one day he just walked into the mountains with his dog named Gus and he never returned. So Keith Reinhardt decided to open an antique shop in the same exact location and he started working on a novel that was based on Young's disappearance. Sadly, on July 31st, in 1988, two hunters found the skeletal remains of Tom Young about an hour's walk from Silver Plume. Not far away was a backpack, a pistol, and the skeletal remains of a dog. They had both been shot in the head, and since a revolver was found at the scene, investigators believed that Tom had shot his dog Gus before taking his own life. One week later, just as Tom Young did, Keith Reinhardt closed up his shop and told people that he was planning to climb the summit of Pendleton Mountain. Despite the fact that he was terrified of heights, he was never seen again. Keith was last seen walking towards the mountain at about 4.30 in the afternoon, which didn't make sense because why would he get such a late start? The hike took about six hours and it was too late in the day and the hike was very difficult. He also wasn't carrying any equipment or a backpack, and he wasn't even dressed appropriately. More than 125 men and a dozen trained dogs searched the difficult terrain for about seven days. Sadly, even one of the searchers was killed after crashing his plane while trying to find Keith. Friends of Keith's later found a newspaper next to his computer. The headline was Tom Young's Body Found. 
Also, on his computer, they found part of his unfinished novel. It read, Guy Gibson, which was the name of his character in the book, changed into some hiking boots and donned a heavy flannel shirt. He understood Tom now and his motivation. Guy closed the door, then walked off towards the lush, shadowless Colorado forest above. When Keith left for his hike, he was wearing a flannel shirt, blue jeans, and boots, just like the character in his book.